reading this book called The Devil's Pulpit or Astro Theological Sermons. And um, you can get a copy of it in the Library of Congress. It is out of copyright right now. Although they've got newer uh, versions of this, this was originally printed in 1857 in New York um, by this reverend who, who's going over uh, maybe demonic stuff. I thought it might be interesting with the fall coming and the Halloween type of holidays. So um, thank you. Uh, without further ado, we shall read about this devil. So, uh, let's take a look at the table of contents before we move on. By the way, I'm going to continue the Trump series. Uh, this is just a different, going to be a different playlist. So, uh, the contents say, Table, A Life of Terror, Introduction, The Star of Bethlehem, Part 1s, 2, and 3. And I don't know why they put a pencil on that, but... And then it talks about John the Baptist, Raising the Devil, Part 1, of Raising the Devil, Part 2, The Temple, The Unjust Judge, Virgin Paratura, St. Peter, Judas Iscariot, Vindicated, St. Thomas, St. James, etc., etc. Anyway, this is, this is written by a reverend, uh, but it is about the devil. I guess, and this is to help you, you know, being forewarned, just being forearmed, right? And then it's giving a lecture on Freemasonry, parts one through four, and the Holy Ghost, St. Philip, St. Matthew, the Redeemer. Let's take the next page. Okay, and there's a nice graphic photo here. Unfortunately, I can't rotate it the way they have it. Well, I guess I could, maybe. I don't know how they scanned this. Uh, it looks like a sphere with these different uh, symbols, which appear to be astrological symbols, Western astrology, and it has north, south. Let's see if we can rotate this. Um, is there a rotation button? Let's take a peek. Um, I guess I could I could uh, download this. I don't know. Well, let's just read it, all right? And we'll take a look at that later. Okay, so it says, Introduction with Explanation of Engraving. And see. Okay, this introduction is a key to the astronomical allusions and various mysteries in the Bible, referred to in the Devil's Pulpit, pulpit by Reverend Robert Taylor, Bachelor of Arts, and to similar allusions in Volney, Dupus, and C. Uh, I don't know about their style of writing, but there's an ampersand there with a small C and then a period. If anybody knows what that means, please put it in the comment box below. I have no clue. Uh, and if I do, I'll put I'll put a uh, comment if I find out. Okay, so the earliest worship was that of deity as exhibited in nature, and the study of religion was the study of nature, and the priests, natural philosophers, and hence astronomers, at first honest. But having obtained power or influence by knowledge, the people gave them credit not only for what they did know, but also for what they presumed they knew. And because they could foretell eclipses by calculations based on laborious observations and apparent astronomy, they also presumed that priests could foretell other events. Let's make this a little bigger. Okay, I'm just going to make it a little easier to see here. That's right. Okay. Where were we? Let's see. Uh, pr what they presumed they knew, and because they could foretell eclipses by calculations based on laborious observations 
and apparent astronomy. They also presumed that priests could foretell other events and hence urged on the astronomical priest the character also of astrologers. The priests finding such professions a profitable source of revenue drove these studies to extremity and made mystery where none existed. As this enhanced the priestly character in the conception of the people. To preserve this influence and power, the profession or trade of the priest was made difficult. The Druids or priests of Apollo at first missionaries from India, or of the order of Buddha, had no books taught the aspirants to the priesthood by memory only, and gradually initiated them into the mysteries, making all manner of austerities necessary qualifications, so that none of the among the Druids of Britain, Gaul, Spain, and towards the east were uh, of a okay, inferior character all by their training, were superior men in mind and body, fit to command, and like other men in power, turned that to their own aggrandizement, so that except the sovereignty this order filled every station of profit and honor. Their iterant poets directed the common people, stirred them up to war, or lulled them in superstition, while others directed the education of the wealthy and served the offices of priests, lawyers, physicians, teachers, and statesmen, and all banded in a secret such as were the Druids in the West, were also the Magi, or Magi, of Persia, and the priests of Hindustan and Egypt, one system. In substance governed them all, and the worshippers of fire in Persia, of the sun and moon in India and Egypt, were substantially the same. Each worshipped under God, under the symbol of fire. Or the sun as the most prominent object in nature, affecting being, life, animal, and vegetable, and performing the offices of a good and wise deity. The blessings of nature were personified and its qualities the same as those of deity taught by every symbol which nature affords or priests could imagine. The heavens and stars were divided into hosts with all imaginable qualities in proportion of, as facts were really unknown and natural phenomena were exhibited in fable. In a conjunction of the moon or planets was called a marriage and the sun assumed every, every garb according to the season and constellation in which it was. A raging lion in midsummer when the sun was in Leo, an ox in the spring when the sun was in Taurus, and later times the Lamb of God when the sun took the cross and passed the equator in Aries, the ram, a noxious scorpion in autumn when the sun is in the sign descending below the equator and becoming the harbinger of winter and desolation, and the sun became a man in the sign of Aquarius, or watery season, and in that character was so worshipped, and these four signs formed the celebrated cherubim, which ornamented the columns equally of the Jewish and heathen temples, and have come down our times associated with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. For one of these signs are attributed to each, 
and thus are painted on the windows of the cathedral, Trinity Church, Broadway, New York, built in imitation of an old European church, who copied it from the Roman from a Roman church, who copied it from a heathen temple, thus showing the connection of Christianity with the ancient worship and throwing some doubt on the reality even of the existence in flesh and blood of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. For here on the windows of Trinity are they represented as emblems of the seasons, and of the seasons too, as they were 5,000 years ago. To make these subjects plain, we have introduced a cut, Baal's globe, and sphere would be better. The ancients had something of the kind, so as to follow their pursuits in their studies, as well in their temples or astronomical towers. The engraving must be a substitute, see page I. We just looked at that a minute ago. The two parts of this engraving represent two halves of the heavens. These placed back to back and inflated would represent the heavens or celestial globe. Imagine the earth in the middle, the north and the south poles, of which corresponding in position to the north and the south poles of the heavens and the equator of the earth, exactly under the equator, mark WE, that's west and east in the heavens, and then curved a line with figures and signs on it, will represent the passage of the sun both as it was 2,500 years ago and is now. This line is called ecliptic. Okay, why don't we go do a quick search for a, uh, another representation. Um, it says the Engraving must substitute. Let's scooch back and look at that real quick. Okay, so this is an engraving of illustration of Reverend Robert Taylor's Astronomica Theologica. Let's do this, okay? Um, Alright, let's I'm going incognito because I don't want to be... All right, here we go. Um, astrological map of celestial earth. I don't know if this is the right terminology. Okay, so let's see if we can take a look and... Oops, sorry, let's do that real quick. Oops, let's go back there. Alright, so let's see if we can get a better representation of this to look at. Okay. Um, here is a celestial reference system. How about if we do this Dr. Taylor or Reverend um, So here is a representation. Oh, this is the one. This is the plate and it's this is this is exactly what we were looking at um, not in color. And let's take a look at this. Okay, so this looks a lot like the exact one that was in that astro-theological. Uh, let's take a look. Pisces? West? Okay, does this say West on it? Yes. South. Okay, so this is what he's referring to, the North Pole, the South Pole, um, and this elliptical... Um, motion that happens uh, with the planets and the stars and how this is the devil's pu pulpit is not clear to me but this reverend is talking about it so 
I'm just going to continue and try to make sense out of it. Uh, and that's why I am referring to these maps that are in the book because I'm not sure. I don't know if you're sure. Uh, I wonder why this came up in that search. So this looks like it could be a Kabbalah uh, symbol. Yeah, this is this is Kabbalah. This is the Tree of Life, which is similar to chakras. Now, uh, there's different philosophies or spiritual ways of uh, belief systems, uh, religions, and um, this happens to be by a reverend, a Christian reverend, I believe. And um, let's see the keys to, let's take a look at this one. This is similar. It's showing the ellipticals but it's showing it from a different angle. It's showing it sort of um, superimposed here. So the way that he did it is he's got a split of the northern and uh, the eastern and western hemispheres and um, he's basically uh, so this is called astrotheology or the devil's pulpit I guess Unveiling the Law of Duality in Christianity and Other Religions. That's a different book. Okay, so we're reading a book that's describing this. Um, it's using this map. Okay, so that they're talking about these astrologers. Okay, let's go back to, I believe we were on page five, but it was referring to um, the, uh, I'm going to jump over to V or five. Well, never mind. Let's just skip it. Okay, so we were on this page. Okay, so I put a V in for the for the um, thing. Obviously, that's so you can run searches in this little search box up here when you're on archive.org. It's similar to a PDF search. It tells you all the spots where the V was. I remember we were on V. See here? So I was trying to get it to jump over like it does on a PDF, but it's a little different here. Um, now this is feeding in from the Library of Congress. Uh, Archive.org has a link in there. They have an agreement with them where they scan books or something and they get a, a license to put some of the books up. Okay, so let's get back where we were at. Sorry, I was just trying to make sure this is clear because it's a lot to take in. So it says the the engraving must be a substitute. Okay, so basically to make these subjects plain, we've introduced a cut of Vale's globe. Oh, okay. It's called Vale's globe. And a sphere would be better. But I guess that's all they had. Okay, the ancients had something of a of the kind so as to follow their pursuits in their studies as well as their temples or astronomical towers. Let's jump over to Vale's. Let's see if we can find Vale's globe. Hold on. That's what he called it, a Vale's globe. Okay, so evidently um, the first thing that pops up for Val's globe is a transparent celestial star globe. So if you look at this globe, um, boy, these are really expensive. This one's 150. It's a a globe you can buy for your child, but the Earth is in the middle. Darn it. I'm going to just chop this off here. So, okay, so there's, see the stars are all around the earth, and I guess it can, you can, you can make it spin in the middle, and then, um, so these are called Vales globes. Here's another Vales globe um, that an astrologer would use, but what they have is a flat print 
of this idea that shows where the stars are and the sun um, and the planets uh, around the earth and here's an old-fashioned solid brass engraved armillary sphere with working compass all right so now I think that's pretty clear that they're talking about the planets um, astronomy astrology whatever and um, how the ancients mapped these uh, planets and then they could predict there's going to be an eclipse or something like that and they were very esteemed by the people because they were able to predict hey we're going we're going to have this phenomenon uh, the northern lights or a uh, comet or something and it's because they use calculations um, so and they named the constellations Leo or whatever as, as going on okay let's finish reading this all right so um, the two parts of this engraving represent two halves of the heavens these placed back to back and inflated would represent the heavens or celestial globe imagine the earth in the middle the north and south poles of which corresponding in position to the north and south poles of heaven and the equator of the earth exactly under the equator marked west east in the heavens then the curved line with the figures and signs on it would represent the passage of the Sun both as it was 2,500 years ago and as it is now the line is called the ecliptic observe to the left hand where the Sun crosses the equator or is just over the equator of the earth it is in that part of the heavens marked west and this is known in fact by the perpendicular rays of the Sun striking the equator of the earth and which time we call spring that is we always call it spring when the Sun after the winter reaches the equator and this point happens where and when and it will it will we call at the first point of Aries the ram and mark it on the ecliptic with a ram's horn so they use the symbols okay now I've got all these markers on the bottom all right every 30 degrees we call a sign 12 of which make the whole circle or 36 degrees by the way this is um, actually Western astrology Celtic astrology has 13 um, there's uh, some sort of Chinese astrology and there's also an Indian astrology just to let you know that this book was written in the 1850s and maybe that's all he knew uh, so and also I would like to note that the spelling of some of these words is spelled incorrectly um, they didn't have uniform spelling until later on okay let's continue uh, okay the whole circle of 360 degrees the Sun's apparent motion is through these signs or constellations beginning in the spring with Aries the ram Taurus the bull Gemini the twins cancer the crab Leo the lion Virgo the virgin Libra the balance Scorpio the scorpion Sagittarius the archer Capricorn the goat Aquarius the water carrier Pisces the fishes the Sun during the year passes through these signs rising above the equator in the spring and reaching the greatest declination or distance from the equator to the north at midsummer or in three months and inclining toward the equator at autumn which it crosses at that time and then passing our winter months south of the equator and it is this declination of the Sun which gives our seasons for when the Sun is north of the equator in the heavens it shines to the north of the equator on the earth and gives summer to that part of the winter to the south and vice versa 
now we observe the cut where the sign Aries is. There is the fish where the sign Taurus is. There is the ram. And where the sign Gemini is, there is the bull. Ampersand E period. I have no clue what that means. If you know what that symbol means, please let me know. The reason is this. The sun does not cross the equator year after year in the same part of the heavens, but gradually recedes before it has completed the entire circuit. It is found on the equator, and that is our spring. At that, the point in the ellipse, ecliptic which we call the first point in areas and to this point we give the mark of the ram's horn let it be where it will now 2500 years ago this point was in the constellation called Aries or where we have marked the ram's head and it is now in the fishes that is the equinoctial point has receded more than the entire sign during this period and is now receding in the same ratio so that the 25,000 years this point will go backwards the whole circle and the first point of Aries will again be in the ram and there is strong evidences that more than one such periods have elapsed since then since time or the earth was this retrogression of the equinoctial points is called the precession of the equinoxes because this retro excuse me this retrograde motion of the this crossing point brings on the spring earlier than it apparently ought to be. The effect is the apparent forward motion of the whole constellations or stars from west to east, the direction of the ecliptic and about the poles of the ecliptic marked in the cut with two dots, one north and the other south. This apparent motion of the stars about the poles of the ecliptic effect the relative situation of the stars, not with each other, but in relation to the equator, the poles of the heavens, for these poles, or the north star, will make a revolution about the pole of the elliptic and the constellation Ram Cicut, which was on the equator, is now north of it, and this constellation makes the course of the ecliptic. It is evident that 4,000 years ago it was south of the equator and then the bull was on the equator and the sun in the sign began that year. The evident origins of the worship of the bull or apis among the Egyptians and, the, and of the respect of the cow among the Hindus, it was the period when the signs, the signs, the bull, the lion, the Scorpio changed to the eagle. Scorpio changed to the eagle, excuse me, and the man marked the principal divisions of the year and were kept with religious rites by the ancients, portions of which were incorporated with Judaism and afterwards with Christianity, and hence we find them associated in Trinity Church, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as representative of the seasons. Now, in reading Taylor's discourses, you will better understand a number of references for this, for in his first and second discourse, now republished, he speaks of nearly all these signs, and so in others, and in the first discourse, makes considerable reference to Sagittarius the archer, which should be represented half man and half horse, in the figure in the cut the horse part is left out for contractions are used in the signs but the entire ramble ampersand C are frequently seen I don't understand these ampersands with the um, I don't understand that okay these con 
subtractions beautifully explain Egyptian hieroglyphics and writing by symbols. Besides these constellations called the signs of the zodiac, all prominent stars were grouped by ancients making 48 constellations and these all had theological character, frequently changeable with the position of the sun, for all would be either rising, setting, culminating, coming to the meridian with the sun, advancing or receding from the luminary. For the sun being always in apparent motion afforded all these varieties and apparent motions of the heavenly bodies were well known to the ancients including the doctrine of eclipses, which requires no other knowledge for their solution. The ancients, too, at the very early period became acquainted with the true system of astronomy, and this affected a gradual change in their religious notions. And when satisfied that the descent of the sun in the autumn was a natural and beneficial consequence of the world, the odious scorpion had to be had to give a place to the eagle which by the ancients was seen on the eastern horizon with the scorpion when the bull was on the western the lion in the zenith and the man or aquarius on the opposite or under meridian the favorite position of the globe or sphere with the ancients for these had such instruments and with all manner of fancy groups could be formed and studied in the chamber as well as in expansive heavens. Note, we recently finished a beautiful celestial globe in transparent sections to be used with Vale's globe sphere. The 48 constellations are colored to be easily distinguished on the globe. All the facts referred to in Volney Dupus Taylor and others are clearly seen. Okay, that's going to be it for today. So we've, uh, we've got a little um, introduction to the Devil's Pulpit for background information. And uh, next time we're going to read the sketch and the life of Reverend Robert Taller, who has authored this book on the Devil's Pulpit. And evidently, he was born in 1784 in Edmonton, near London, and was educated as a surgeon under Sir Astley Cooper. But he exhibited strong religious feeling. Okay, well, anyway, he's from the noble classes, perhaps, and is well-educated. And he's writing this book which we now have in our hands, and we shall continue going forward. Thank you for listening. Next time I will read the next chapter. Take care. Bye.